go. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks for dialing in. Um, we've got a very, very special guest today. We've got Laura Summers. She's the founder of Debias AI. So I met Laura through IXDA Melbourne, which is an event we have at Deers. Um, she was to present sort of before the whole COVID lockdown happened, um, but unfortunately we um, that didn't happen. But luckily for us, she's uh, agreed to talk to us today. So Laura is a multidisciplinary designer, researching technology ethics and building tools to promote fair machine learning. So what I was talking to Laura about and where uh, my interest was piqued was making fairness and ethics practical and having um, ways beyond just frameworks to actually make it happen. So I think we've we've talked a lot at Dias and, and in the XD team around principles and ethics and frameworks, but when it comes to actually making it happen, how does how does that go? Um, so Laura is also the human behind the ethics litmus tests and the Melbourne Fair ML Reading Group, um, passionate about feminism, digital rights, and designing for privacy. They're all very important things. Speaks, writes, and runs workshop at the intersection of design and technology, and will also be speaking at Agile Australia's upcoming responsible tech event in June, which is exciting. So Laura is here with us today to discuss the state of machine learning fairness. Um, as I mentioned, from checklists and frameworks to developer tools and mathematical definitions of bias, uh, Laura is going to wrestle with the elephant in the room. No pressure. Um, how do we encode fairness into our models when we can't precisely define our ethics as a society, team, or even as individuals? That's a big, big topic. Um, so after Laura's finished, as I said, there's a link to Slido in the chat, um, but we'll go through any questions anyone has at the end. So if you've got anything at all, drop them in there and we'll go through. So without further ado, I'll get out of the way and I'll hand over to Laura. Thanks, Laura. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, so just bear with me a second while I try and present. Um, and hopefully that will be quite straightforward. Let's just see if I can present the right tab. So once that's up, can you all give me a little thumbs up, thumbs down if you can see that screen? Uh, we got the spinner. Okay. And I can see Aaron says yeah. yes. Did not appear for you, Tom? Mm, nope. Mm. Let me... Yeah, that's good for me. Okay, thanks, Nigel. Yeah, I've um, got it as well, thanks. You've got as well? Good for me. Uh, I've, I've got it. Great. Don't pin, don't pin Laura. That's, that's the problem. Got it. Okay, so, all right, I'll try and get cracking. Um, yeah, so as Tom mentioned, I am the person behind ethics litmus tests, which is the reason you may have seen me around the interweb, um, and as he also mentioned, I've been researching um, sort of practical questions with developers about uh, organizational and technical challenges to tackling this work um, on the day-to-day. -day. Um, and yeah, I, I'm not going to talk much about ethical litmus tests for the session because I have way too much other stuff to cover, um, but I'm happy to chat about it asynchronously, so do wave at me if you want to talk about these specifically. Um, and I've Check this into the chat, but also wanted to flag that the slides are live, and I, I do reference a lot of links and papers and things, so if you are curious to know or read further, don't stress about trying to capture that as I talk, because um, that's all live and ready for you to grab. Okay, so let's get into it, these juicy topics. Um, oh yes, I can, absolutely. Sorry, I'll talk into the chat and do that. Here are the slides one more time. So yes, let us talk about ethics in technology. Um, so yes, some years ago now, I joined a fintech startup, and I was having a dig around in their code base, having having a look at like all these different um, tools and things they had set up. And one of the um, primary things that was built for their onboarding was this risk assessment quiz, and it was essentially attempting to determine like how much people would um, 
like cope with in terms of their money going up and down through the like, course of the investment roller coaster that is the market. So if you're familiar with investing, this is probably a concept you're familiar with the idea of a risk um, assessment or a risk score. And as I was as I was digging around, I had sort of a look at this code and I was thinking, huh, that seems strange. It looks like there's this hard role like that's been baked in. And I started talking to the founders about it and, and they said, oh yeah, yeah. So we were looking at the statistics about women investors and we realized that women tend to generally be more conservative investors and we wanted to protect them. So we decided to write a rule that said like regardless of the answers, um, if a person identified as a woman on our quiz, regardless of how they answered, they would never get the highest risk portfolio. Um, and of course, like alarm bells went off for me and I was like, well, this seems really uncomfortable and I'm not sure I, I'm okay with this. And um, we you know, talked it through and, and essentially like they were coming at this very much from a point of view of wanting to um, protect people and also wanting to reflect the state of the world. And they really hadn't grappled with this deeper question of whether the state of the world was okay or was sort of the ideal world or was the world that existed based with a, a bunch of socially um, like engineered norms and ideas about money that may be not ideal or maybe not worth propagating. They just really hadn't grappled with those questions. So I think um, I like to start off this sort of discussion with a practical example because I think it's very easy for these things to slide under the radar. And in fact, I think this code had been up for at least six months before um, basically women engineers looked at it and said, hey, this isn't okay. And, um, and I, don't, I don't raise this example because I think they were, you know, particularly evil founders of trying to do the wrong thing. I think they actually genuinely were trying to do the right thing, just really hadn't thought it through deeply. Um, so yes, I want to start by establishing some, some terms that help us think about this stuff. So there's this idea of descriptive versus normative. And to make that real, when I talk about descriptive, what I mean is actually describing the world as it is. So like actually observing what's happening and describing it. So in this picture, we can say girls wear pink. This is a descriptive statement because all the girls in the photo are wearing pink. It's not a social statement. It's just a statement of what's happening. Whereas if I'm a girl and I'm looking for what to wear and someone says, well, girls wear pink, that could be considered a normative statement because I'm being told I should wear pink regardless of what's in my closet, regardless of whether that's a color that suits me, regardless of even I like it. So when we talk about the difference between descriptive and normative, what we're saying is like there's a difference between a statement which is really like based on observation and is sort of a scientific observation versus a statement which is more a statement about what we think should happen or what our personal values are. So a way to think about that is, is this talking about the way the world is right now or the way the world should be? So for an example, to make this real in the world of machine learning, um, one of the applications that we're seeing getting a lot of traction is this space of infrastructure maintenance. So what we're seeing in this photo is a drone and it's taking photos of a bridge and what it's doing is looking for cracks and trying to assess whether or not the bridge is safe to drive on and whether it's going to continue to be safe to drive on for some time into the future. Um, so this is, you know, it seems like a pretty obvious task, but like if you unpack it a little bit, what's actually going on is this drone is making a normative statement. It is saying, hey, we want the bridge to continue to be strong enough for cars to drive over it. And if it degrades past a state that we find unacceptable, well, market is unsafe. So that's actually not descriptive per se. It's not just saying is there damage or not. It's, it's creating like a normative statement about how much damage becomes unsafe or when we need to go back and do that kind of repair work to say this will make it safe again. So we make normative assertions all the time and when we don't make them about people, they don't sort of feel so wiggy, but when we make them about people, we start to like get uncomfortable whether it's okay or not. Um, but yes, I just want to encourage you to think, if, if you're trying to unpack whether something is a descriptive or normative statement, um, try and think back to the idea of the drone because we, we design these rules, we design business rules into systems about what is wrong and what needs to be repaired all the time. 
And that judgment call is just implicit in that statement. And so saying it's a status quo isn't okay when we're talking about humans and human behavior and human interventions. Saying, oh, well, it's a status quo, so we don't need to make a change, is, it's really not good enough. It's not a good rationale for not intervening or not reassessing. Like, we make these statements about every other part of our life and every other part of the world, and we should be making it about humans as well. Okay, so now for something fun. I'm gonna play you about a minute of this video. Hopefully, you can see it okay. I love this video. I'm not gonna lie. If you feel like having a little dance, go for it. Academic classical statisticians sit down and listen. You're about to witness the power of algorithms. Linear regression is sucking us into a recession. Interpretability is dead. The gold standard is now prediction. Please, you think because a method is new, it isn't bad. Everything about your big data movement is a fad. All you have is a glittering enigma wrapped in a complex riddle. Nothing but a black box with lots of little knobs to twiddle. I'll take a black box that delivers accurate answers on any question you can ask it. From genetics to cancer over a transparent parent box we understand that's interpretable with tractable math yeah too bad it doesn't work so good though algorithms are just another kind of statistical inference that's fine you're advocating scientific ignorance you're like the wizard of oz in a balloon floating over the earth come back i can't i don't know how it works here's how it works data goes in predictions emerge talk to mark zuckerberg if you really question its worth forget it stay bottled up in the college and data model Okay, so that's enough of that. You can watch the rest of it if you want. Um, so this is like a really silly uh, video, obviously. It's like, it, it sort of um, came across my eyes maybe six months ago, and I thought, oh, this is really silly, and I didn't really think much about it. But recently, I was having this discussion with my partner, and it, it came back to me, and I thought, wow, it actually does this really good job of describing this tension we see in machine learning models, and particularly in unsupervised or um, deep neural networks. So places where we don't necessarily have a good understanding of how the, the um, algorithm arrives at its inference, um, we don't understand it deeply, we just see data come in and literally information comes out as described in the video. And so this tension I want to describe is this idea that the pursuit of profit in these sorts of models is not necessarily the same thing as a pursuit of knowledge. So the work it takes to build and train an ML model to win at something or to achieve something is not actually the same as the work that's needed to understand the relationship between that data model and the outside world, like what, what it's doing in the world, how it interacts with other systems, and how those impacts might flow, flow out. Or another way to think about that is winning is not the same thing as understanding. Um, I hope this isn't too wild a concept, um, but I think it's quite important for us to grapple with the fact that unlike almost every other form of science, where the more we actually do the work of the science, the more we understand, when we think about machine learning, multivariate models, and particularly this unsupervised style of models, um, doing the experiment, running the model, training it further, tweaking the data, that's not necessarily the same thing as understanding more. And in fact, understanding more can be a whole other piece of work. So if you think about that thing he said in the, in the video, like, oh, you know, does it matter if we're building a mouse trap as long as it catches more mice than the other one? And well, I think we could actually take that metaphor and pick it apart really quickly. So would, would it be possible to build an unethical mouse trap? Like I argue, yes, probably yes. Um, like what if it catches only pregnant mice? What if it catches only old mice? What if it catches more than more of one gender than another? Like you might care about like maintaining the mouse population overall, or you might only care about not having mice in your kitchen. But fundamentally, I think you could ask a few questions and then see how it could be problematic, even against just you know the sort of toy model idea of a mouse trap. So I have a sort of conclusion from this, which again, this might be a little bit of a hot take, and um. I, I realize that this isn't a sort of back and forth, but perhaps in, in the comments at the end or the questions at the end, if you want me to um, chat to this more, you want to like poke my assumptions, I welcome that. Um, but my hot take is when we're building these machine learning systems within the, the capitalist corporate context, 
First, there is no prediction, only intervention. And what I mean by that is we never build a model just to predict something about the world and then do nothing about it. We only build a predictive model if we want to do something about it. So we're creating some, some sort of intervention on the world. We're acting on the world. We're not pure scientists. And similarly, I'm, I'm pitching that classification is never a descriptive force, always a normative force. So when I make a classification about a person, that has an impact on their psyche, that has an impact on their idea of the world and their idea of themselves. Um, if, they, if they actually agree with that classification, it can reinforce their sense of self. If they disagree with that classification, it can create a sort of internal turmoil. Um, a, a nice little example I like to think of that helps us think about like how classifications about people might actually really matter is this sort of like Aesop's fable I, I know about um, a boy and a bundle of sticks. So a boy is told by his um, father, oh, you're not a very good kid. You don't go and do your chores very often, but I really need some wood for the fire. I really need you to get out into the woods right now and like get some wood for the fire. And the kid goes out into the woods and he's like grumbling and just like picks some like sad, slightly damp sticks and brings them back. And he's, you know, he doesn't feel very good about himself. And so he doesn't really put any effort into the work. But the next day, his dad goes off into the fields to work, and his grandma, who spoils him rotten, says, hey, well, look, son, I love you, and I really want, you know, like, I really want the best for you, and I think that you're a really good boy, and I think that, you know, if I ask you to do a chore, you're going to do it so well, I won't have to ask you again. And then later in the day, she says, oh, we could use some more wood for the fire. And because he's feeling great about himself, the boy goes out into the woods, and he's like, I'm going to carry back as much wood as I possibly can comes back with his arms laden, filled with wood. And, um, you know, this, it's, it's a little bit of a cheap story, but I think it, it helps us think of this thing that who we think we are starting to tell ourselves about who we are is important. And the, you know, reinforcement or friction that we receive from the outside world is also important. So normative statements um, actually matter. So yeah, the moral I'm trying to make, or the, the sort of statement I'm trying to make to try and sum all, this, all these ideas up, is that predictive models, when we deploy them in the world, they're never descriptive. They have an interventional force. And that means that it's our job to assess whether that force is OK, is fair, is ethical. OK, so let's talk about taxonomies of bias. When we talk about bias in data science and machine learning, um, I think it's helpful to also consider what kinds of harms can happen. So there's two sort of primary buckets I think are worth kind of keeping in your head. The first one is allocative. So that's the idea that this model or this automated decision system is in some way um, allocating something. It could be goods and services. It could be a good thing. It could be like money for your mortgage. Excuse me. Or it could be a bad thing. It could be whether or not you stay in jail for another two years or get to be released on parole. So allocative could have a positive or a negative side, but it is essentially whether you get something or get denied something. And the other type of harm is representational harm. So that's whether people who exist in the demographic that's being sampled show up. Are, they, are their voices not being heard? Are they being misrepresented? Um, there's a type of bias that I'll talk about later called aggregation bias. And that's basically the danger of trying to glob together too many different kinds of people, different kinds of demographics, um, and feeling really significantly sometimes in some ways to, to like understand how um, something might be different or might be um, distinct for the sub-demographic. Um, so yes, allocative harms, whether or not you get something, representational harms, whether or not you show up in the data. So I was, I've been reading a lot about bias in machine learning, and I've seen a lot of models and taxonomies, and I, I tend to find them all quite overwhelming. So I tried to come up with a map I thought was a little bit easier to hold in your mind. Um, so, so my approach to this is that I, I think of the types of bias we might see in a machine learning model sort of across four phases. Um, the first one being the data source, where like the sort of the world being like the source of all data that we might be capturing, how we capture that data, so like that process of sampling and like pulling it into our model, how we define the model and experiment with it. So that's a laboratory phase. And the factory phase is like how we push it out into production and like how it's working on the world 
on a day-to-day -day basis. So to examine these a bit more, if we think about the data source, I think like the good question to ask when we start thinking about a model is, is this good training data? Like, is there something that's happened in the past that's worth learning about, that's worth sort of forming a predictive inference over? Um, if decision-making for, for instance, where to open a shop has been completely ad hoc, has been totally rough and ready, then maybe I can't form an inference about whether I should predict the next shop opening location based on that historical data. So there's reasons to ask this question just purely from a, is this going to be a useful tool point of view as well as, is this going to propagate harm? Um, the other thing we're thinking about at the sort of very global view, pun intended, is, is there historical bias at play that might cause a problem that I might be propagating um, unintentionally or that, that might cause harm that I don't want to cause? And unfortunately, historical bias is like the biggest, most diffuse and hardest type of harm to mitigate. But it is also something that we really need to grapple with because it's easy to sort of focus in on other types of harm mitigation, focusing on, for instance, how I sampled my data in the first place. And if their historical bias exists, then I may not be able to resample my data to solve the problem, for instance. Like if I'm if I have a historical bias where there's very few women CEOs, the ways that I sample my data set of CEOs isn't going to solve the problem that there weren't women in that data set to begin with. Um, so yes, thinking about the historical bias, um, and that, that can be anything from gender bias, um, race bias, socioeconomic status, um, all the intersections you can think of. Um, when, we, when we're in the space, we talk about this thing called the protected attribute that's usually the demographic that you don't want to train your machine learning system on. So I don't want it to learn that women haven't been CEOs in the past, so they shouldn't be CEOs in the future. So when we think about historical bias, we're thinking about all of those protected attributes that we don't want to become features in our machine learning model. Um, the next phase when we think about bias is this, this space of data capture. So that's, that's a whole bunch of big questions, and I'm covering a lot of big topics quickly, so I will just acknowledge there's a lot of devil in the detail here, and we don't have enough time to, to sort of dive into it. Um, but yes, to talk to data capture, we're thinking about things like, does enough data exist in theory across all the demographics that I want to capture? Um, do I have a data capture technique that um, inherently privileges one type of person over another? Like a pragmatic example could be, if I'm doing polling and I want to make phone calls, I might realize that millennials never pick up their phones. They just aren't going to pick up their phones. So I'm going to only get good data from older demographics, but not so much from like people in their 20s and 30s. I might ask questions about if I have data storage constraints or if there's privacy issues around the data that I can capture. Um, there may be data piping issues. There may be data that exists that I want to get access to. But, you know, I may have to do cleaning or formatting. So there's all these questions around, can I capture this data and does it mean something useful to me? And when we think about the bias that can exist here, um, again, it can be this issue of representation bias. Like, can I see um, enough information against every person, uh, every type of demographic rather in my data set that I can like get enough um, samples from them to actually form useful inferences? Um, an example of this, I like to think about, uh, apparently there was a polling company that was looking at um, data in the last US election and trying to um, capture information, I think, about people of color with college educations who voted for Republicans um, in like a state like Mississippi or somewhere, somewhere in the deep south and in a place that's traditionally votes them democratic. So they were really having trouble finding real instances of this demographic they had identified. And so what happened was they kept polling this one person over and over and over again. And when he changed his mind, it flipped the graph, like kind of really hugely one way or the other, because he was the only person representing that particular set demographic. So that, that issue of one person's sort of opinion holding space for a whole demographic of people is like obviously a problem. Um, there's also questions of measurement and sampling bias. So like, are the tools we have um, 
actually able to get us the information we want? Is the data going to be good? Um, do we have good proxies for the thing we're trying to measure? So this question of can I actually assess something like is someone going to vote? Um, what proxies might I look for for that? Do I have confidence that they're going to map well? Um, the third space of bias that we can think about is in this laboratory phase. This is when we're defining our machine learning model. This is when we're thinking about like, you know, what are the constraints? What are the features? Um, how much noise am I putting into my sample? Uh, you know, like those knobs to twiddle that the video talked to, like that's, these are all those knobs that we're gonna twiddle. Um, and there's the, the question I like to think of for the laboratory phase is, we've got our data now, can we form meaningful inferences from that data? And that can, um, when we think about the types of bias that can exist, um, we can think about things like aggregation bias, which I, I mentioned before, which is when we try and glob together too many or too disparate sub-demographics and sort of fail to make meaningful or articulated inferences about them. Um, a useful example to think about is uh, say you have an app and it's looking at skin for um, abnormalities like melanoma. So if my app has only been trained primarily on white toned skin, and then I have someone with dark toned skin coming in, taking photos and showing, you know, uploading it to my server and asking, do I have melanoma? If I don't have enough instances of that person's like type of progression of the disease, I'm, I'm not going to be able to give them a useful answer. And importantly, I might not have externalized that I don't know enough to know. Um, another uh, way of thinking about the inferences that we might form that can that sort of um, cause a bias is in the evaluation of what's coming out. So that's, again, thinking about whether the features that have formed to give me this score or classification or prediction um, are meaningful or not. And whether or not like, I can assess that based on looking at what the machine learning model has output. And the last section, the last sort of phase that I think about is this factory phase. So once we've plugged our machine learning model into a production system, it's getting live production data, it's ticking over in real time, it's probably like implemented into some sort of front end somewhere, there may be some kind of prediction or classification coming out of it. And this is, at this stage, we're asking the question, like, can we deploy these inferences we've made effectively? And the, the sorts of deployment bias we might think about um, could be if the model, for instance, has low certainty um, over some specific classification, but that's not externalized to the end user. So they may think that all of these classifications are high certainty, so they're, they're not being given enough information to be able to like, assess the outputs of that model correctly. Um, and there's a whole bunch of different ways that we can think about how the design choices, the UX choices, the um, supporting information around what the model is saying can either help or harm um, the kinds of interpretation of those, of those outputs. Um, and if you want to dig into this a bit more, this paper that I'm looking here has a much longer form version um, exploration of all these different kinds of bias that I just touched on. And it, it can help you like think through more examples of how we might like see those kinds of bias um, exist in the world, um, sorry, exist and come into our model at different phases. But to keep trucking, um, I want to go through that same map to talk through how we might also consider mitigation techniques for those kinds of bias that we could see coming into our machine learning model. So for ex example, if we were looking at this data source space, so this is a space of historical bias, um, as I mentioned before, this is also the space that's like biggest, hardest to um, potentially assess how we might intervene or how we might prevent the bias. Um, and in fact, it's probably the one that I'd argue is the hardest for technology companies to really like meaningfully move the lever on. But we do have the choice not to do the model or not to do the model in that way. If we observe that there's historical bias and it's problematic and we don't have any levers of control. So grappling with historical bias can, it can really require um, expertise outside of development and sort of product expertise. So, you know, areas like sociology, political science, 
Um, arguably, you might need to have a degree in intersectional feminist theory to really meaningfully grapple with historical bias. Um, and, you know, fair if you don't have that time and fair if you don't have that expertise on the team. Um, but being aware that that's something that you might need or that that's, that's the kind of expertise you need to grapple with those questions um, is worth kind of keeping in the back of your head. Oops, sorry. Um, data capture. So when we talk about mitigating the kinds of harm we can see in data capture, um, that's, that's a whole gamut of different techniques. And um, this is often the space that people like to jump to because we have more control. We can, um, you know, we have pretty well-established techniques for solving these kinds of problems. Um, there's a whole world of synthetic data generation for machine learning modeling, and that's doing the work of trying to solve um, some of these uh, problems of low representation of sub-demographics. Um, you can also do work to capture the data better, label the data better, um, or look for better proxies for the quality you want to measure. Um, a good example that I like to think of when we think of proxies needing to be meaningful for us to be able to avoid harmful bias is the Apple credit card scandal that happened, um, I want to say like half a year ago, three, year, three quarters of a year ago, where um, DHH, he's a Twitter guy, um, I think he's from Rubyland, he tweeted that his, um, he and his wife both applied for an Apple credit card. And they were both granted one, but his credit limit was something like 10 times higher than hers. And I've, I looked into this example and thought about it quite a lot. And I have a pitch that I can't verify, I not have actually seen their data, but I think might help us think about proxies. So if they have trained their model based on this proxy for credit worthiness um, being credit accepted, we're missing some important information. So there's maybe if you think about the process of capturing credit card data um, acceptance flow, there's applying for credit, being granted credit, the amount that you're offered, and the amount you accept. And I think it's important to sort of distinguish between the, the amount you're offered and the amount you accept might be very different. And the amount you accept probably isn't as good a proxy for your data work, sorry, your credit worthiness as the amount you were offered in the first place. So if you consider that statistically women are actually um, shown to be mostly a bit more financially conservative than men, they may be um, accepting lower credit limits and then those lower credit limits are being sort of turned into this proxy for lower credit worthiness that is completely wrong when we think pragmatically about the nature of credit worthiness. So, yeah, thinking about the proxies we can capture and then like the fundamental quality we want to measure is a good way of thinking about how we can mitigate at data capture. Um, laboratory is, um, this is this whole space of explainable ML, explainable AI. Um, that's uh, libraries like SHAP and LIME and um, AA360 from IBM. Um, I put some links to these libraries a little bit later on, but these are all basically the um, approach of taking one uninterpretable model and then piggybacking another uninterpretable model on top of it in the hopes that it will tell us something about the features, the attention, the things that gave us the answer that we see at the output phase. Um, and it's, it's also the place where we can put our thumb on the scale, for instance, if we wanted to rebalance or adjust the classification. Um, and I see people doing that post hoc after the classification comes out. So you sort of see the sort of fundamental or the original results, and then you see another, another um, smaller model that's doing a bit of a rebalancing. Um, so that's, that's the place that we think about, yeah, trying to fundamentally understand or get the knowledge that I spoke to before, as opposed to just, um, just seeing the number coming out and seeing whether or not we think it makes us profit. And then the factory phase is where we could potentially externalize machine uncertainty. Um, we can add some design thinking into the deployment of the machine learning model. Um, there's a whole bunch of discussion around things like automation handoff and handback um, and how feasible and practical that is from a human experience point of view. Um, and considering these questions of like uh, automation bias, so whether people when they're being presented with a number, we'll be able to take that as 
one piece of information under advisement with a spectrum of ideas, or if they're going to be thinking about it as like, this is the answer. Okay, so that was a lot of big ideas, and I'm sorry I don't have like time to go into each of them more deeply, but if you have specific questions, ask them at the end. So grappling with bias, I think of three big bucket approaches, and this is just to try and prevent myself from going crazy because this is a space that's exploding at the moment. There is so much happening, and there's a lot of competing ideas, frameworks, strategy documents floating around in the world. Um, I'm actually in the middle of trying to make a map on GitHub, which is just like a big um, link list of like all of the things I'm seeing happening, um, which I will publish when it's live, when it's ready to go. It didn't quite get it ready for this talk. Um, but yes, I'll, I'll talk through some of the specifics um, as we go through. So in academic and corporate research, that's things like these mathematical definitions of fairness that we're seeing um, cropping up in like this sort of competing approaches for trying to think about how we can specifically encode a fairness notion that could then turn into a code test or an assessment against like the, um, the demographic spread, the, um, the, the modeling spread of the results from the model. So if I was able to look at, for instance, um, all the sub demographics and then look at the overall spread of the results, I can assess whether or not I've actually, um, I've actually sort of given sufficient fair treatment to people regardless of their, um, you know, racial, ethnic, gender, preferences, sexuality, etc. So it gives me a way of trying to actually test for fairness in a more rigorous way, a more rigorous approach. Um, as I mentioned before, there's this whole field of explainable AI, which is asking questions both about whether we as developers can interpret our models and whether we can then explain those interpretations to people. So there's kind of two big sections in this field. Interpretability is like fundamentally, can we understand what's going on? And explainability is, can we meaningfully share that information with other people? And particularly end users and particularly complex questions are hard to explain, et cetera. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, there's also the space of model drift, which is asking questions about as production data changes over time, um, are we seeing fundamentally some kind of unfairness or drift occurring in our model, and how do we identify that and monitor for it? Um, and then we're seeing a lot of multidisciplinary research that's asking kind of big sociological questions about the nature of machine learning and the impacts of technology in the world. Um, so just to make this definition stuff a bit more clear, there's a whole bunch of competing um, fairness measures. Uh, there's so many of them, and they keep cropping up, so I didn't even try and come up with an exhaustive list. But we've probably heard of these ideas of true positive and false positive and true negative and false negative. Um, and just to make that pragmatic, like if I'm thinking about something like an MRI scan to observe for a disease, I might be more... Um, more sort of comfortable with getting lots of false positives because I would rather see patients who are not actually sick keep an eye on them, retest them in six months' time, and make sure that I'm keeping an eye on their health. Whereas if I'm creating a model that's trying to um, determine whether or not people should stay in jail when they come up for their bail hearings, this is like the, the compass recidivism example, um, I might prefer more false negatives because I prefer to keep people out of jail. And I would say, if people are staying in jail who shouldn't be in jail, that's less fair. So you can see like how very quickly these reasonably like straightforward measures can be very hard to think about in a sort of global one size fits all way. Like it's very contextual. Some other um, examples you might hear of are group fairness, um, which is asking questions about whether we're seeing the same results for different sub-demographics, predictive parity. Um, counterfactual fairness is kind of the new hotness in the academic research. And it's basically asking the counterfactual question, if, in, if the circumstances were the same, but one of my attributes was shifted, so say um, I was turned into a person of color and we run the experiment again, would the result be the same? So you're basically saying holding all other variables equal and I push something into a, um, I push one attribute in this protected attribute space, will I see the same result? And the test is attempting to assess whether or not 
I fundamentally have um, like learned things about the quality I'm trying to measure that isn't attached to these fairness measures I don't want to learn about. <clears throat> Excuse me, get some water. So self-regulation is this big space. We see industry bodies, we see corporates, we see you know, the FANG companies, Apple, Google, Facebook, all producing a bunch of work in the space. Um, we're seeing so many things proliferating. So policy documents, principles, documents, values, checklists, activities, worksheets, risk assessment frameworks. And then as I mentioned before, we see things like this explainability models, code tests, um, frameworks coming up. And less of this monitoring and notifications, but I anticipate we'll be seeing more of this kind of CI, CD for machine learning as we see the field maturing over the next couple of years. Um, and like I recognize this is a huge bucket. And again, hopefully I can give you a more exhaustive list of links in a couple of weeks when I've finished up my, um, my framework. Um, but I just want to make a quick aside on principles documents. Um, I have a bit of a bee in my bonnet about these big, pretty um, principles or values documents that say things that are very hard to argue with. Like, we want to make technology for the purpose of human flourishing, or we want to improve diversity in the group of people building the technology. Like, these are hard things to argue with and hard to, hard to say, oh, that's a bad idea, but also very hard to test for. And also, importantly, you could see instances where matching one of the principles and matching another sort of are different choices and not compatible with each other very quickly. And I feel like this kind of high level, hand wavy principles is like less than useful because it's not helping us build this question, this, this capacity to grapple with these questions at an engineering level on a day to day basis. Um, and particularly if you've, you're working in an organization that thinks that the job is done once you put together your big strategy document, then uh, I, I feel like what you've done is suck up the oxygen for some of the other important work that needs to happen. Um, and then external regulation is things like external audits. And again, like we're not seeing a lot of this yet, but I expect we'll see it soon. Um, industry body standards. I know that a couple of bodies in Australia are starting to put together standards for machine learning. Um, and we, we see some hints of the law that's coming in. Um, so we know that consumer protections is going to be an interesting vector of attack to help us consider um, individual consumer rights for machine learning. Um, and GDPR has like also started to touch on the space. And some things that we might see coming soon um, are the idea, like I've seen several com countries sort of pitching this idea of a national policy or national agency. So just like we have a food protection agency, we might have a machine learning protection agency. Um, a human right that I heard pitched that I thought was a really nice idea was this right to a human parsable explanation. So if you have been subject to a machine decision, it, we might consider it a human right that you should be able to receive an explanation that you can understand. Another pitch I've heard, which I really like, is the idea of standardized labels. So like when you look at a, a tin of food, you see that it has X grams of sodium and Y grams of sugar. We might see the same with data sets that are especially these big sort of um, commonly used data sets that get propagated across like um, NLP and computer vision like that everybody uses over and over again. We might see where are the weaknesses in these data sets, which are the demographics that aren't getting seen, um, what was the source of the data, maybe see if it's like too specific a cut in time and space to be useful, to be more generalizable. Um, and another, another thing, um, this Wired article talks about this idea of FDA style drug testing for machine learning. I think that's a fascinating idea. I'm not sure the government has the sort of technical capacity to implement that yet. Um, and yes, this fairness definitions explained um, link in here is a, another paper that talks through um, these fairness definitions that I just briefly touched on in much, much more detail. Okay, so just a few wrap up thoughts. So coming back to the map, I want to really, if you take one thing away from this talk, I want it to be this. Bias in machine learning and bias in technology in general is not one thing. And our job is to first identify what it is and where it's occurring, then try and measure it as best we can, and finally to come up with mitigation strategies. But if we jump straight to mitigation strategies, 
we're almost always going to be solving for the wrong thing. I also think it's important to acknowledge that like any other engineering skill, failure is inevitable. So it's easy to see, to think of ourselves as being ethical and therefore reject that our systems could have a harmful impact on the world. But I think that's a problematic mindset and I really wanna help us move past it. So rather than thinking I'm an ethical person, therefore I build ethical tech, I want you to think I'm an ethical person, therefore I explore the space of ethics problems in technology. So to put that another way, if you write a bug, it doesn't make you a bad programmer. And if you make an ethical mistake, it doesn't make you an unethical person. And we've done a good job in engineering of removing the idea of a get blame culture and saying we care deeply about collectively building our capacity as engineers and not focusing on pointing blame. And I think that's an important way of thinking about ethics as well. So I argue that we need to draw a line in the sand and say we're, we're flawed, we're squishy, but we can still aspire to build ethical tech. And it's important that instead of claiming moral authority, we claim the moral imperative to do the work in the first place. So I'm not gonna pretend that this is easy or that the work is clear cut and unambiguous because it's really not. But I, I really hope that you've taken away from this talk that it's, it's actually engineering work. It's about identifying trade-offs, working through use cases and making difficult compromises. It's about staring unflinchingly at complex systems and refusing to blink. Um, if you want to catch my activities and worksheets and definitions work that I do, um, it's up at my tiny lecture. And thank you so much. That's the slides again. And let's go to questions. Hopefully we have a few minutes left. Thank you, Laura, so much. That's a lot to take in. I, I definitely like the acknowledgement of the complexity. I think that is. <laughs> Very important. I like the line in the sand, but it can be like a, a bug in the code. Um, uh, yeah, I know we've wrestled with frameworks and principles and things like that before. I think it, it can it can definitely be a waste of time. Um, so we do have a few questions here. Uh, we don't have many votes though. So if anyone wants to jump in and vote things up, um, I can call a couple of them out now though. Um, yeah. Andres has got a question around, do you have any resources to get help from statisticians or ethicists to help reduce kinds of bias and unexpected impact on all kinds of affected parties? Um, are there people um, that you work with or can recommend? I mean, I guess there's yourself as well. Um, yes. Um, can I just ask quickly, should I stop presenting and just go back to face-to-face -to -face view? Yeah. Yes, yep. let's do that. That sounds good. I think we've got the slide on now. Um, Yes, I, um, I've made a few connections with other people working in this in sort of interdisciplinary engineering cross ethics space. So there's a group called Ethological that's working on consulting with teams um, the same way that I do and, and also building up these kind of deeper capabilities. They were thinking about um, coming up with a certification for ethics for tech, which I think is a great idea. Um, there's, well, there's, there's um, the sort of MOOC learning track. So there's a bunch of people doing really interesting work around data ethics for data scientists. Um, and I could um, dig out some links. So there's a group over in California. There's a, a professor called Rachel Thomas who's doing really great work in the space. Um, there's also, oh, there's just so many groups. Like I, I, I'd be afraid to like start listing them off because that's all I'll talk about for the rest of the, the call. But um, I would oh, certainly- that's, that's great. Yeah, I, I would certainly be able to, um, point to some specific um, courses, if that's interesting to you. Mm. Um, and like local groups, there's not so many. That, so there's more of this work happening over in the States and particularly like Germany, Berlin. Um, yeah. But certainly there's a lot of people thinking about this. And um, as I mentioned, there's, there's a ton of resources coming out that help you like frame the question and also start to tackle it with like practical activities. And I really like that approach. Yeah. That's great. I, just a reminder for everyone, uh, Laura will be on Slack this Friday between 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. So we can kind of dig into some of these as well. Um, mm -hmm. Some links and some examples. Um, we've got another question here from Rowan. Uh, how important is an organization's own maturity in making an inclusive workplace in order to make ethical algorithms slash tech? Mm 
Yeah, that's great. A, that's question. another big one. Another big one. Um, yeah, I think about this a lot. And I think in the sort of trifecta of culture, process, and code, I think culture comes first. So if you live in a culture of fear and low trust, if people are afraid to raise their hands and ask questions, then sort of everything else is borked, right? And if you're making if if you're making really scary machine learning systems in a culture like that and you don't feel like you have the agency to move the needle on improving the culture, I'd say get out of there if you can. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry that that's not a great answer, but um, yeah, culture, the culture and the space to ask difficult questions, to ask for the time to review those kinds of risk assessments with your team is really important. And I think everyone in the world who's doing this kind of work is grappling really deeply with this at the moment and trying to find um, what their personal guardrails as a team should be, like where is safe, where is you know where do we feel confident where do we feel like this is starting to push a line we don't know how to describe um so yeah i think the having the permission to ask the questions and build the skill set as a team is like the most important part yeah yeah that psychological safety yeah exactly um so we got another one here uh what's your take on responsibility for model mistakes company uh, or individuals such a good question um so for my fair ml reading group we read a paper last week called the moral crumple zone um i can also mm -hmm. check that into the into the slack um and that was that was a really interesting exploration of this deep question of um the sort of like downstreaming of responsibility so if you think about everyone who's responsible for a model coming into creation and then getting deployed into the world everyone from the ceo to the like tech lead to the individual developers and designers um, down to the the operator at the end um, it's describing this phenomenon to offload all that responsibility to the operator at the end in order to protect and um, avoid responsibility rebounding back onto the system more generally. And it's essentially about protecting profit. Um, and I, in my opinion, um, we should and will be seeing um, individual de developers and CTOs and hopefully C-suite people starting to see some actual repercussions for the harms that these things can cause. Um, maybe it will take a couple years, maybe not. I know that in Europe we've seen some people getting sued so far. Um, and hopefully the law will, will be catching up soon so that particularly in the in the worst and most egregious cases, we'll be seeing people like actually have to take some responsibility further upstream. Um, and in my opinion, the operator is like got the smallest piece of the responsibility. They're just the schmuck who got told to press the yes, no button, essentially. Um, and they're really the one who's like done the deep thinking about the trade-offs, about whether this is okay or not. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we've got we have five minutes left, um, so we do have time for a couple more questions. If anyone else wants to drop anything in there um, or pipe up on the Google chat, um, how do we compare the impact of human bias versus AI bias? Are we hypercritical, too idealistic with ML biased approaches? I think that's how. Oh, that's a great question. I think that's. Um... I, I had a section in this talk that I cut out because the last time I gave this talk, it was an hour and 15 minutes long, and I thought that might be a little bit extreme <laughs> for a brown bag. Um, but where, where I basically asked this question about um, why we focus in on machine learning bias or like the, the sort of, let's say, the, the result of um, capturing and propagating the existing bias in the world like i think we have to we have to grapple with the fact that none of these sorts of biases and harms are new or like um newly introduced by machine learning so much as just amplified and made bigger because of the scale of machine learning so while you could say a judge who's terribly racist or terribly sexist can have a really bad impact on the world that impact is still quite gated to the sort of scope of cases that they will see across the course of their career. If you had an AI judge that was seeing 10 or 100 times the number of cases and had those same biases baked in, the scale of harm is exponentially higher. So we, we just have to grapple with the fact that the harms machine learning is introducing are not necessarily new, but the scale of impact 
is so much bigger and so much more existentially threatening that it forces us to basically ask these questions we should already have been asking about human decision making anyway. Yeah, yeah. I think we've got, we got time for one more. Do you think, Laura? Yeah, uh, happy to. I, I think jam. you're just rattling this off. This is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, just so one, la one last one. There's a lot of bias in things we already use, e.g. Google search. Mm -hmm. What about biases in out-of-the-box ML services? What's your view on this? Is that um, my my view is that they're certainly there, and the less control you have over the engineering and the design of the machine learning algorithm, the less visibility you have to what's there. So mm -hmm. you have like these off-the-shelf services. You then have auto ML, where you have like an algorithm that's pre-trained, and you plug in your data, and then you have these like. And then, you know, if you think of the three tiers in machine learning, there's like fully automated, there's kind of like semi-automated where you have an automated ML model and you plug in your data. And then you have the custom model that you've built and designed from scratch. So the, the less visibility you have over the back end of that model, the less you will be able to necessarily observe or um, understand what's happening or how intense that bias might be or whether the impact is problematic or harmful. Um, and yeah, like it's a great question, and there, yeah, there's there's like a deep conversation there. But um, I think yeah. I think the the question that you should be asking yourself, if you think back to the map, like you want to be trying to do some mapping before you write a line of code, before you get too deep into the process, you want to do a quick map of exactly what do you think could go wrong based on the kinds of data that you want to capture. Like, what are the kinds of bias that exist historically? What might happen in your sampling? What might happen at the machine learning modeling phase? And do some mapping, and then make some engineering decisions and make some product decisions based on how risky, how existentially problematic you think those harms you've identified could be. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And um, that kind of raises questions of accountability and how we kind of mm come full circle on that as well. Mm. Um, thank you, Laura. Thank you so much. I know this has been a couple of months coming, um, but we got there eventually. <laughs> so again, on Friday, mm. Laura will be back on the Slack channel. So if you've got questions viewing, brewing, if you've got some, uh, you want some more links or information, um, Laura's agreed to, to be there for an hour um, and we can yep. thank her in person. Thanks thank everyone you so for coming. much. Appreciate your time. Cool. Have, Bye, enjoy everyone. the rest of your Tuesday. Bye, peeps. Bye.